So if you've seen any, any of my videos, you know that I'm a fan of uh, the ESP32 and doing DSP and audio processing on, the, uh, on that microcontroller. Uh, thus far, I've been using the ESP IDF and ADF, which are supplied from Espressif, but I thought I'd do a video on the suggestion of Andreas Spice on an Arduino-based toolkit, the Arduino Audio Tools. Uh, and I'll include a link below to the repo with the, the, that hosts those tools. So what I plan to do uh, in this video is demo some functionality of that uh, toolkit, uh, starting with a simple sign generated sine wave to I2S, uh, then follow that up with I2S input to I2S output, and then finally uh, I2S input to an FIR filter to I2S output. So obviously that last one is of most interest to uh, people who are interested in building uh, software-defined radios. Um, and I'll include a couple of different uh, FIR filters, uh, a couple of 60 tap low pass and high pass filters, uh, as well as the sort of canonical uh, 90 degree Hilb uh, Hilbert filter uh, across the left and right channel, which is uh, of most interest to uh, single sideband processing. Now I will say that those above examples just scratch the surface of what's available in this toolkit. Uh, and I'll likely be doing some follow-up videos on uh, some of the other great functionality in this toolkit. Okay, so let's just quickly walk through the uh, hardware setup that I'm going to be using here. So, um, for my codec board, I'm going to be using this PMOD I2S, I2S2 board, uh, which I've used before, and I'll include a link below. Uh, the thing that I like about this board is it's very simple. Um, you just need to supply it with the uh, I2S signals, uh, the master clock, uh, LR clock, and so on and so forth. You don't need to do any programming on it, so you don't need to set up any registers uh, or, or set anything up. You just need to supply, supply it with the signals, and then it's good to go. Now, the, uh, speaking of the master clock, so the master clock, uh, the word, word select, or the uh, LR clock, uh, I've got them, they're separated on this board and you have a, a, a set for the input and a set for the output, but I've just got them all tied together. Um, there's no reason in these examples to, to keep them separate uh, and it simplifies the pin count to do so. So the uh, moving on to the ESP32, and that's a 2x19 uh, pin variety. I know there's quite a few different varieties uh, on Amazon and elsewhere for these boards. I'll include a link to this specific board. Now, one of the things you want to look for to simplify your life is you want to get one that exposes GPIO0. Uh, there is a variety out there, the 15-pin variety does not expose GPIO0. You can use GPIO3 for the master clock, but uh, kind of simplifies your life if you've got GPIO zero there. And so finally, just zooming out to the input and the output, um, I've got the input, which is the, the blue jack coming from my signal generator, and then the output uh, I'll alternatively be using uh, off to my oscilloscope and uh, the speakers. So let's move on now to the actual pins uh, configuration between the ESP32 and the uh, PMOD I2S2 board. Okay, so let's uh, just walk through the, the actual pin settings between the PMOD uh, and the ESP32. And obviously this is PMOD specific, but uh, if you have a look at the, uh, the other um, uh, codecs out there, you'll, all, you'll see they all have these, uh, these, these uh, input pins in common. So just quickly walking through, uh, as I said, the M clock, LR clock, and S clock are tied together. So, they're, so respectively, M clocks off GPIO zero. Uh, 18 is the LR clock. Also, you also see this referred to as WS or the uh, uh, word select clock. And then finally, the S clock, which is also uh, referred to in other literature as the bit clock, is set to pin five. So zero, 18, and five for the uh, I2S uh, clocks. And then on the input and the output, so the digital data from the ESP32 goes to uh, pin 4 on the on the PMOD board, and that comes from pin 19 on the ASP32. And then finally, uh, we've got the digital data to the ESP32, and I've got that configured for pin 17. Now, just a note on these pins, there's nothing special about these pins. With the exception of the master clock, you can choose any pins, uh, any valid uh, GPIO for the, for the settings here. Now, the master clock is a special case, 
and at least as uh, uh, you know for the ESP32 it has to be one of pins 0 1 and 3 but anyway uh, let's move on to now the examples so let's start with the uh, sine wave on input and sending to uh, I2S on the output and um, this toolkit is uh, very similar to other audio toolkits that, that I've used. It always deals in uh, sources of data and sinks of data and this is this is kind of no exception. So in this case the source of the data is this uh, sine wave generator com com combined with the generated uh, sound stream here. So basically what this does is it creates a a uh, continually populated buffer of the, of a sine wave at the frequency of interest. So the frequency of interest in this case is uh, 1 kilohertz. Uh, and then the sync of that data is our I2S stream output. And you can see here, here's the configuration of the I2S stream output. And you can see you set the sample rate, which in this case is 44.1 kilohertz bits per sample. Now the uh, PMOD board supports both 16 and 24. I'll be using 16 in all these examples. I2S format is the I2S standard. And then uh, you've got these which define the pins here. So, uh, and these are the pins that I went through before. So uh, we have uh, um, the master clock on pin zero, uh, the word select or LR clock on 18, bit clock on five, uh, now there's the data for transmission on 19 and the data on receipt on 17. Uh, in this case, because we're um, just sending data to, to the uh, I2S, the, this pin 17 is not used in this case. So let's uh, uh, go and have a look at uh, the output on the oscilloscope and the speakers and what we should really see is a 1 kilohertz tone on the output. So let me fire off that example, Just the, I'll reboot the uh, the ESP32. So there's a one kilohertz tone. Uh, I did forget to mention that it, it, it emits that uh, one kilohertz tone on both the left and right channels. Uh, so you can see there there's, there's two tones. They're in phase with one another. Let me unplug that and I'll plug the speaker in and we should hear that one kilohertz tone. And there we go. So what I'll do now, let me just turn that down a little bit. I'll just change that to uh, a uh, two kilohertz tone. Uh, I will flash that to the board. It'll take a little while to flash. So there's a two kilohertz tone on output. And just to note, uh, uh, these examples are a little bit different to the ones that are included uh, on the, the base repo. Uh, I'll include a link to the GitHub, uh, to my GitHub repo that has all these examples on it. So let's move on now to the next example of interest, which is uh, basically uh, an I2S stream on input to an I2S stream on output. Okay, so in this next example, um, we've got an I2S stream on input and then going straight through to an I2S stream on output uh, with no further processing. So uh, basically in and out should be identical. And you can see the I2S setup is identical in this case. Um, in this case, however, the RX pin is going to be used to ingest the incoming data. Uh, so the code's very straightforward. I've got a single I2S instance there, and that single I2S instance handles both the in and the out. And this is uh, this is a little bit different to the uh, examples in the uh, in the primary GitHub repo. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention uh, in the in the last section is here's where all the magic happens. This copy it or copy. Uh, copier is um, an instance of the stream copy class and that's where basically all the shuffling of the data between the sources and sound sources and sound sinks happens. So anyway, let's uh, uh, fire this off. So what, what we'll basically be doing is injecting different um, uh, tones from the signal generator and we should hear those different tones uh, in the speakers. Okay, so in this next example, I'm going to be injecting a sig a signal from my signal generator and the left and right channel, I've decoupled them. So now I can, uh, for example, have a two kilohertz tone on channel one and a one kilohertz tone on channel two. And we should see the output of that on the oscilloscope. Now, uh, it, this might not seem that impressive, but uh, we're not just seeing the direct output of the, uh, of the, the audio tones coming from the signal generator. 
that the tones are going all the way into the ESP32 through the uh, codec. They're being processed in there and then they're being shuffled out the other side of the I2S in interface and onto the oscilloscope. So uh, there's a lot going on under the covers and obviously what we're setting up for is once you've ingested the data into your ESP32, you can do whatever sort of processing you want on it, whether it's a FIR filter or IIR filter or, or whatever you want to do. So anyway, let's uh, move over to the oscilloscope and uh, we'll see those uh, different tones on the oscilloscope. Okay, so here we are on the oscilloscope and you see I've got, the way I've got it set up at the moment is I've got a one kilohertz tone on both channel one and channel two. So let me change that a bit. What I'll do is I'll put a 1.001 uh, uh, kilohertz tone on uh, channel one in this case. And you can see indeed now I've got a uh, 1.001 kilohertz tone coming out in the oscilloscope. So let me just change that again. I'll go back uh, and then let's go up to two kilohertz. And there you can see that now I've got a two kilohertz tone coming on the uh, uh, coming in the output there. So what this confirms is that all the data is being shuffled into the ESP32, being processed and then shuffled out on the other side. So while the uh, result isn't that impressive, what's going on under the covers certainly is. And what that sets us up for is the next example, which I think is the most interesting one, is let's do some FIR processing in there We'll do a high pass filter, a low pass filter, and then that Hilbert uh, 90 degree phase filter. So that's coming right up. Okay, so here's the, uh, the final example we're going to. And just to explain the setup here, so basically we have I2S input. So we'll be sending uh, the uh, codec uh, input from the signal generator. Uh, we'll be processing that in the ESP32, applying an FIR filter to it, and then sending the result to the output. And I'll show the output both on the oscilloscope as, uh, as well as on the speakers. So here's the setup here. Uh, and all these classes are uh, you know in the toolkit itself. So we have stream copy, which is the same as from before, which is responsible for shuffling the data between the input and the output. And then we're introducing this new component called filtered stream, which allows us to attach to that stream uh, a filter, in this case an FIR filter, to both the left and the right channel. So what I've got here is um, basically uh, I've configured the left channel as an FIR filter with the coefficients uh, for plus 40 deg 5 degrees phase shift, uh, a Hilbert filter phase shift, and minus 45 degrees. So I'll include a link to a previous video that I did um, that shows you how to actually derive these filters. Um, but basically, this is a 160-tap uh, 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 pair of filters that the end result will be a 90-degree phase shift between the left and the right channels. So anyway, let's uh, move over to the oscilloscope. Let's see that in action. We'll come back and have a look at, the, uh, at a low-pass and a high-pass filter. Okay, so just to describe the setup here, I've got a one kilohertz tone being injected on both the left and the right channel from the signal generator. That's being ingested into the ESP32. Uh, we are applying an FIR filter on uh, each of those channels, on the left and the right channel. Uh, on the left channel, we are subtracting 45 degrees in phase. On the right channel, we are adding 45 degrees in phase. The result being that we've got a 90 degree phase shift between the left and the right channels on output. Um, so obviously there's a lot going on under the, uh, under the covers there. We've got that Hilbert transform, it's processing it using the convolution algorithm with the 160 taps that we hear, that we, uh, that we have, and uh, here's the output. Um, and if uh, the, the test always to confirm 90 degree phase shift is to uh, Look at the traces in XY mode. You should see a perfect circle um, if, it, if, it's a, uh, if it's an accurate 90 degree phase shift, and that's exactly what we've got here. Now, ob now obviously, you know, it's just super exciting for, uh, for those of us interested in building software-defined radios because an accurate and efficient mechanism to do 90 degree audio phase shift is at the heart of, uh, of every software-defined radio, at least those radios that... Uh, uh, that you need to do uh, sideband processing in. 
So let's move now to uh, doing a high pass and a low pass filter. And uh, before I move on to that, uh, I, I will include a link to a previous video I did that uh, is used to derive the coefficients. Um, unfortunately, uh, that was the Iowa Hills software. It looks like that site's gone offline, which is a bit of a shame. Now, uh, the thing is, with the uh, high pass and a low pass and even a band pass filter, uh, you can use simple Python to, uh, to compute the coefficients. I haven't found a way though, um, a simple way, I will say, I mean, there's a lot of deep math in this, but a simple way to produce the, uh, the Hilbert coefficients for the 90 degree phase shift. So if anyone knows of a, of a simple tool I can use for that, I, did, I couldn't find a way easily in Python to do it. Um, you know, without resorting to the to the deep math under the covers. But any in any case, uh, so what we'll do is we'll comment out the um, the section for the um, for the, uh, the the high and the low pass filters. Um, and these are 60 tap filters uh, at uh, 44.1 kilohertz um, processing. Uh, we'll go over and have a look at those on the oscilloscope. Okay, so let me just walk through the uh, setup on the oscilloscope here. So. The yellow trace here is the output of the, uh, of the pathway that includes the high pass filter. The magenta trace is on the output of the low pass filter. So, and I've got my signal generator to couple the two channels uh, together in terms of frequency. So what I'll do is I'll increase the frequency and what we should see is that the yellow trace uh, increases as we go up in frequency, that's the high pass filter. The magenta trace should decrease as we go up in frequency, that's the low pass filter. So anyway, I'm at one kilohertz now uh, for both. So let's uh, slowly increase that up. And you can see the yellow trace is increasing. I'm now at uh, 1.6 kilohertz, um, up to two kilohertz now, going up further. 2.2 kilohertz. Uh, I did forget to mention this is a uh, filter, both the high pass and the low pass filter are 2.2 kilohertz uh, um, uh, corner frequencies. And then as we go up further, you can see the yellow trace is increasing and the magenta trace is decreasing. So the yellow pass, uh, yellow uh, trace being the high pass filter. Going down again now, and back to the corner frequency, which is 2.2 uh, kilohertz, which is, and you can see both the traces uh, have identical amplitudes. So anyway, that was all I had planned to uh, demo with this uh, audio toolkit. Um, it certainly uh, got me excited, this audio toolkit. Um, like I said, I've been using the, e uh, the ESP ADF and uh, IDFs for some time. They are a bit of a pain to use, quite frankly, and uh, I think you know the uh, uh, this toolkit puts in the hands of uh, uh, of, uh, of hackers like me uh, a, a lot of uh, sort of fun opportunities. So what I'll be doing in some subsequent videos is uh, digging into some of the other cool stuff in the uh, audio library, and uh, I'll be doing some demos of uh, of that capability. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and that's all for now.